So, you have a sci-fi movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. It's gonna be called The Matrix. The Matrix? Yeah, the idea is that we're all living in a massive shared computer simulation called The Matrix. Oh, kind of like the simulation that you and I live in, where everybody except Hollywood actors have the exact same face. What? What? Anyway, so we're gonna start the movie with some cops trying to arrest this lady, Trinity, and she's gonna kick all their butts. Oh, how is she gonna do that? In such a way that movies are gonna try to imitate for a full decade. I like the sound of that. But then an agent is gonna chaser, so it's gonna get serious. An agent? Yeah, they're super fast and deadly, and they can take over anybody's body. Oh, so how come an agent didn't take over one of the cops that were in the room with Trinity? Well, we only find out that they can do that later in the movie. Oh, so they can't use that power until we find out about it? Exactly. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, so Trinity's gonna manage to escape through a phone, which is how you get out of the Matrix. So why was she in the Matrix anyway? Uh, she was keeping an eye on the main character, Neo, I guess? Did she have to be in the Matrix to do that? Not really, no, but this way we get to watch her kick some butt. That does sound fun to watch. So then we're gonna meet Neo, who's like this computer hacker guy. Oh, and what's he like? What do you mean? Like, what's his personality? Oh, no, he doesn't have one of those. Oh, he doesn't? No, the furthest we're gonna go with his character development is that at a certain point, he's gonna point at a restaurant and say he used to eat there. Oh, well, that's more than enough character development. I thought so, too. He used to eat at a restaurant. That's relatable. And so what happens with Neo? Well, through a series of vague chat messages and clues, he ends up going to this club where Trinity is. Okay. And she's gonna give him some vague warnings that aren't super clear. She lures him to a club to tell him nothing. Basically, yeah. Kind of a waste of time. Yeah, and then the next day, some agents are gonna put a bug tracker in his stomach and then not track him with it. Wow, people are doing a lot of useless stuff. And then eventually, this Morpheus guy is gonna talk to Neo on the phone and be like, this phone is tapped. Come meet us at the Adam Street Bridge. If the phone is tapped, doesn't that mean the agents heard all of that? Yeah, I guess so. So I imagine they're waiting for him at Adam Street? Nope, they, they, they don't show up. Why not? I don't know. So they didn't use the information from their bug tracker and they didn't act on the information from the tapped phone? Correct. Very bad agents. So then Neo's gonna wake up from the Matrix inside this big gooey pod thing. Oh, those are not fun to wake up in. I should know. What? Why should you know? I got drunk and passed out at the Insectarium right in the slug exhibit. Oh my god. Yeah, not a fun morning. Anyway, then this giant squid machine's gonna grab him by the neck and flush him down a tube. Why wouldn't the machine kill him? I guess it assumes he'd die after being flushed. Doesn't seem like a chance that a supercomputer would take, but okay. So then Neo is gonna meet Morpheus's crew and just learn a bunch of stuff about the Matrix. Like what? Well, he learns that the machines have these fields of millions and millions of people. And they're kind of using our brains as a neural network for computing, you know? Oh, well that sounds way too complicated. It's not though, it's kind of like the internet. Yeah, no one's ever really gonna use that. Nobody's gonna know what you're talking about. I feel like they'll get it though. Hey, how about we just say that the machines are using humans as batteries? Everybody understands batteries. Humans would make awful batteries and make more sense to use cows if that's the case. Oh. Oh, cow matrix. That's another thing. If we go with the battery thing instead of the neural network thing, then there's no reason for the machines to even make a matrix. What? Why? Well, how would they benefit from making a dream world for their batteries? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So then let's just compromise and do my thing. Okay. Well, I guess I don't have a say in the matter then. You don't. So then what happens? Well, we're basically going to find out that Morpheus thinks that Neo is the one and he's going to free all the humans and stuff. What made Morpheus think that Neo was the one? Unclear. Huh. And then after a bunch of training, Neo and the gang are going to go see this lady called the Oracle. Why do they all need to go? Because I want them all to die. Oh my god. Yeah, they're gonna get betrayed by this little Italian Judas on their team. Huh? You gotta watch out for those. You do. So then pretty much everybody's gonna die except Neo and Trinity, and also Morpheus is gonna get captured. Oh no. Yeah, so Trinity and Neo need to go back into the Matrix to save them. How do they do that? Well, they start by murdering a lot of innocent people. What? Yeah, a big old murder spree. That's not very nice of them. No, and it's kinda weird to have main characters murder innocent people, but it's gonna look awesome. Awesome. Oh, well, that's okay then. And then they're gonna manage to save Morpheus, but they have to get to a specific phone to escape. I guess time is of the essence if agents are after them. Definitely. So then Morpheus goes, and then Trinity's like, hey, Neo, I need to talk to you. Wait, what? She's like, I need to tell you something. There, there's something I need to tell you. Let's talk. Let's talk for a little bit. I need to tell you something. What the hell is she doing? They need to go. Well, she wants to talk right now. I don't know what to tell you. Very strange priorities. Yeah, so then an agent shoots the phone just as she escapes, and Neo gets stranded. That is entirely Trinity's fault. Sure is. Then there's gonna be a bunch of fighting and Neo's gonna get killed. Oh my god, it's gonna be tough to wrap up the movie if Neo is dead. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, because the power of love is gonna bring him back to life. Wait, who's love? Trinity. She's gonna give him a little kiss. Oh, did they have a romantic thing going on? Not really, no, but he's the male lead and she's the female lead. That is pretty romantic, actually. And so then Neo's gonna be super powerful. He's gonna make an agent explode. Wow. And that's about it. He's gonna fly away. Well, it sounds great. And 
hey, maybe everybody in the movie could wear leather. What? Why would they wear that? Leather is the coolest thing you can wear. Have you seen me? I have. I look fantastic. It just doesn't seem like the best material to, you know, do martial arts in. Leather is tight. That's, that's part of the problem, yeah. Very cool material. Anyway, so what do you think of the movie? Well, it sounds great. I think we should do it. Amazing. And then we can make a couple of sequels and really elevate the whole franchise. Those are always a good idea. So, you have a Matrix sequel for me? Yes, sir, I do. Although I did realize we kind of made the perfect standalone movie with the first one, and this one's completely unnecessary. Oh, actually, our finance team said it's very necessary. Uh, well, they do call the shots. So what happens in this thing? Well, at the beginning of this one, we're finally gonna get to see Zion, where all the unplugged people live. And what's that like? It's a big cave, it literally looks like hell, and everyone has sweaty raves in it. Oh, cave raves are tight. Yeah, so we're just gonna have this super long scene of sweaty people grinding on each other and Neo and Trinity going at it. It's gonna go on for a while. Oh yeah, how did they fall in love in the first movie again? By being the male and female protagonist. Very romantic. Yeah, so we're gonna spend like 30 minutes in Zion with just a bunch of slow-paced political and philosophical conversations. It's gonna go on for a while. Why are we spending so much time in Zion? Well, because the audience has to understand what's at risk here. A big cave where people slowly talk about philosophy and politics all the time? Exactly, so the stakes are pretty high here. People are not gonna want to see Zion destroyed. I kind of want to see it destroyed though. That sounds much more exciting than everything you just described. Oh, dang it. So does anything exciting happen in the movie or is it all talking? Oh, there's some exciting stuff, all right. You know how everybody loved Agent Smith in the first movie? Oh yeah, it's gonna be hard to top him as a villain. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, I figure that this time, instead of Agent Smith, we can have, you know, multiple Agent Smiths. Yeah, I mean, logically more Agent Smiths should be more exciting than just one. That's smart. Oh, thank you so much. But how is it possible, though? I mean, he died in the last movie. Well, we're gonna say that in the first movie when he exploded, that actually set him free, and now he can copy himself. How does that work? Unclear. Well, okay then, as long as there's more of him. Oh, there will be. Wow, 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 wow. And towards the beginning of the movie, some people from Zion are having a meeting, and Agent Smith passes by and leaves an earpiece as a message to Neo. What's the message? It's kinda like, hey, Mr. Anderson, I'm back, it's the sequel, I'm coming for you. If he knows we're a bunch of Zion people, people are meeting, why doesn't he attack them? Well, he's kind of like playing with Neo, I guess. Isn't he a program? He is. Why would playfulness be a part of his programming? Because it'll make for a cool moment. Oh, okay, great. Oh, and speaking of cool moments, later Neo's gonna have a fight with a bunch of Smiths. It's gonna go on for a while. Can't Neo jump inside people and make them explode? Yeah, but he's not gonna. Why not? So there can be a fight scene. Oh, okay. And then at the end of the fight scene, Neo's gonna fly away. Why didn't he just fly away in the first place? So there can be a fight scene. That makes sense. Yeah, and also this way we can show off our new CGI technology that does not make humans look like rubber in any way. Kinda suspicious of you to specify that unprompted. Oh, whoops. Whoopsie! So what else happens in this thing? Well, the good guys are gonna go see this French program, cause they need to go see another program called the Keymaker. Okay, and why do they need this Keymaker guy? Cause they need a key to open a door. I'm just adding stuff in to stretch this out so action can happen. Okay, gotcha. So this French guy's like a jerk, right? And he doesn't want to help, but then his wife helps when he goes to the bathroom, cause she's like fed up of his infidelity. These people are programs, though? They are, yeah. I guess they're programmed for couples drama. I don't know what's going on. Well, okay then. So this lady kills a henchman, and then she tells the other one, go tell my husband what I did. What? Why would she do that? Well, because there's a fight scene coming up. It's right here in the script. Oh, okay, yeah. Nice of her to set the stage for that. And also, she's like, I'm only gonna help you guys if Neo kisses me like he means it. What? Yeah, this program's horny now, I guess. I don't really know what's going on. Yeah, this is getting kind of weird. So then there's a fight, and let me tell you, Neo is in no danger whatsoever. Oh, wow. The stage are so low that I feel nothing. And then there's a big chase on a freeway with some agents and these two programs that can like turn into ghosts. Well, so what does Neo do? Well, actually just before the chase, Neo runs through a door and ends up in the mountains. Can he just step back through the doorway and be somewhat closer? Well, the thing is I had to find a way for him to not be in the chase because technically he could just grab the key maker and fly away. Oh yeah, this guy's way too powerful for sure. Yeah, he is. So then after a couple of minutes of this cool car chase, Superman swoops in and saves the day. What? Sorry, Jesus. What? Sorry, Neo. Oh, okay. Anyway, so eventually Neo's gonna meet this guy named the Architect, and he built the Matrix. Oh, and what's he gonna do? Oh, he's gonna talk. He's gonna talk so much. Oh. Just talking and talking and talking and using fancy words like ergo and vis-a-vis -vis and concordantly. Why does he use fancy words like that? Well, because I want everybody to know that I know those words. It is pretty impressive. It is. So this guy's gonna reveal that Neo is actually like the sixth one, and every time they reboot the system, a new one shows up. Oh. Yeah, and then Neo has to choose between saving Zion and 
and saving Trinity. Right, they're in love because they keep telling us they are. Exactly. So she's like falling from a building and he flies so fast that there's a trail of like debris and cars flying behind him. If he's moving that fast, wouldn't she like explode when he reaches her? Actually, no. Why? Because that works. So then Trinity dies, but Neo pulls a bullet out of her heart and then massages it and brings her to life. So we're just giving him like infinite power now. Oh, I'm not even done. Then in the real world, he stops sentinels with his mind. What, he can control things outside the matrix now? Yeah, he's just, have you heard of God? He's God now. Oh, I have heard of God, yeah. But anyway, taking down the sentinels in the real world did make him sleepy, so he's in a coma now. Oh, wow. And then we're gonna end on a big cliffhanger. What's the cliffhanger? Well, Neo's in a coma, and he's lying right next to a guy who's being controlled by Agent Smith. What? How is that possible? Well, earlier in the movie, we have Agent Smith control a guy from Zion who's on the phone, so he gets transferred into the real world. Agent Smith can travel through phones and take over people's flesh and blood in the real world? Exactly. How's that gonna work? Oh, I just write things down and people film them. Oh, neat. Yeah, so what do you think? Well, wait, so does anything get resolved? No, not really. I mean, the machines are making their way to Zion, but there's like a whole other movie for that. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, this does sound like a solid part one. Right, well, technically it's part two. Of course, but also absolutely not. Right, but anyway, as long as we have Keanu Reeves doing some cool stuff, I think people are gonna be happy. Oh, they will. I can't see Keanu getting much more badass than this. So, you have a third Matrix movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. Very exciting. Extremely exciting, sir. So we're gonna start this one off with Neo quietly waiting at a train station for quite some time. What? Yeah, he's at a train station, kind of like a limbo of the mind. He's having a nice conversation with a little girl and her parents. Okay, 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 and then something exciting happens? Well, he's gonna be there for like the first 25 minutes of runtime for sure. Okay, okay, and what's the conversation about? Oh, well, it turns out that the little girl is a program and so are her parents. So programs can have kids now? Apparently so, and they made a deal with the French dude from the last movie to bring the little girl into the Matrix. Okay, so is there gonna be some action in this thing? I would just, I would just love to see some action. Oh yeah, there will be some action, for sure. Okay, good. Kinda sprinkled in between all the talking. Oh my god. There's gonna be just so much talking, sir. Just so much talking. You can't even imagine. Well, I mean, if it's well-written dialogue. Oh, you know it, sir. Neo's gonna have some awesome lines like, uh, why? And also, uh, what? Oh, you know what? That is pretty freaking good. Thanks, I know. So anyway, Trinity and Morpheus want to get Neo out of this train station, so they go see the French dude. And how does that go? Oh, well, it's pretty tough. Along the way, they have a less exciting version of the lobby fight from the first movie. Okay. And then they go into this guy's nightclub, and he's like, tell you what, if you give me the eyes of the Oracle, I'll let Neo go. Oh, that's a big dilemma. Are they going to turn their back on the Oracle to save Neo? That's going to make for some really interesting choices. Yeah, you'd think so, but Trinity's going to point her gun at his head and be like, yeah, we're not doing that. Oh, okay. So they finally go get Neo, and then they have to deal with the impending attack on Zion. Wow, so what does Neo do? Well, he takes off, he leaves. Oh, he does? Yeah, he's like, I feel like I need to go to the Machine City, so he takes off and Trinity goes with him. Okay, yeah, sure, you do you, Neo. But then it turns out that Bane is on their ship. Oh, from Batman? No, that guy from the last movie, you know, Agent Smith infected his mind in the real world? Oh, yeah, okay, I forgot about that. Yeah, everybody did. Kind of wish it was the Batman villain. Sorry. So wait, how did Smith manage to take control of somebody in the real world again? Uh, don't worry about it, sir. So anyway, Bane and Neo fight, and Neo ends up going blind. Oh, man. Yeah, but now he has, like, fire machine vision of the real world. Oh, well, okay, yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, not gonna affect things too much, to be honest, but it's gonna look cool. Well, you know, great. Anyway, so then there's this massive battle in Zion, right? Like, thousands of sentinels show up. Okay, are there any characters in Zion that we actually care about? Oh, well, uh, Morpheus. Oh, Morpheus. Yeah, Morpheus. He's, he's on his way. Oh, he's not actually there. No, he's on a ship that has this big EMP they need to set off, so he's on his way as fast as possible. Well, Morpheus is one of the few characters people connected with, so it'll be cool to see him pilot a ship, I guess. Oh, no, he's like a co-pilot? Oh, he is. Yeah, Niobe is piloting. So what's Morpheus doing? Well, he sits next to her and keeps telling her that she's doing just, you know, a great job. So there's a massive battle in Zion just entirely filled with characters we don't really know or care about. That's right, sir. It's gonna go on for like 30 minutes. So how are these characters fighting against the Sentinels? Do they have some, uh, some cool weapons? Oh, you know it, sir. They have these big mech suits with these big old guns. And they control these things remotely? No, nope, they strap a dude right into it and leave him fully exposed to damage. Oh, they do? They sure do, sir. And also when they need to reload, a kid has to roll a cart through a war zone to get to them. Wow, it feels like they didn't think those weapons through at all. Would have been a lot more practical to have, like, EMPs everywhere. Yep, yeah, probably. But this way we get to have a big old action scene. That's a good point, but it's gonna be tough for them to survive for even, like, a minute if there are thousands of sentinels in Zion. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, instead of spreading out and covering 
more ground. The Sentinel's kind of attacking a line, you know, so it's easier to shoot them. What? Why would they attack like that? I don't know. Fair enough. So both the humans and Sentinels are fighting in just the most impractical ways. That's right, and that's how we're able to extend this battle to be like 30 minutes. Wow, 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 wow. So anyway, later we catch up with Neo and Trinity, and they're flying to the Machine City. Oh, and how does that go? Well, on the way, we're going to see some, like, yellow Sentinel energy waves fly right through Neo. Oh, my God, and what's that going to do? Unclear. But, like, what's the payoff? None. Oh, okay. So then to avoid the Sentinels, they fly above the clouds, and Trinity sees the sun for the very first time. Wait, so if the sun is accessible, how come the machines are using humans as batteries? You know, they could have just built some tall towers, used solar power. Well, sir, originally in the first movie, the machines were supposed to use the humans as a neural network, not batteries. Oh, yeah, that makes a ton more sense. How come we didn't do that? What happened there? You asked me to change it to batteries. Oh, yeah, I did do that, didn't I? Whoops. Whoopsie. So anyway, what happens next? Well, they fly back down and crash land the ship, and Trinity dies. Oh, she does. She does, sir, but not before talking for like five minutes about love. Feels a little long. Oh, it will feel long, yeah, for sure. So what does Neo do now? Well, he strikes a deal with the machines that if they stop attacking Zion, he'll go take care of Smith in the Matrix. That's not something that the machines that control everything can handle themselves? Apparently not. I mean, they've rebooted the Matrix like five times. Why not give that a go again? Unclear. So Neo goes into the Matrix, and it's just full of Agent Smiths. Now, we already had Neo fight a bunch of Agent Smiths in the last movie, so how are we going to up the excitement this time around? By having him fight one Agent Smith. Oh, that sounds significantly less exciting. But it's raining now. Oh my god, it's raining? Okay, I didn't realize that. Okay, that's going to be awesome. It sure is, sir. And now Agent Smith can fly, so instead of the choreographed kung fu fight, it's a whole lot of air punching. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. And so eventually Neo lets Smith take over his body and they all blow up. Very cool. Yeah, and so then Zion is free and that little girl from the train station, she makes like a rainbow colored sunrise. Oh, rainbows are tight. Does she make a leprechaun too? Does she make it? No, she doesn't. Yeah. So, 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 so what do you think? Well, I think it's definitely a movie. Yeah, it is, sir. Although I'll be honest, it was very difficult to come up with anything worthwhile to write after, you know, how good the first movie was as a standalone thing. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Pretty exhausting, to be honest. And I'm kind of scared that people aren't going to like it very much. Legitimate fear to have, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we should do this again sometime. What? So, you have a fourth Matrix movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. And I have to say, it was tough to crack this one because of how the trilogy, you know, ended and the story was complete and all, all done. Right. The story was over. It was, uh, it was done with. But you figured out how to bring it back. I did, sir. I kinda did. Amazing. So let's hear it. Right, so we're gonna meet an older Neo, right? And he's a famous video game developer who made a super popular trilogy called The Matrix. Oh. And the trilogy is done, you know? The story's complete, but the decision makers are forcing him to make a fourth one. Right. And he doesn't want to do it, but his boss is like, Warner Bros. are going to make this fourth one with or without us. Do we have a problem here? <laughs> You tell me. You want to take this outside, buddy? I would love to take this outside. Well, then let's take this outside. Fine with me. This is nice. Yeah, fresh air, right? Makes a huge difference in my mood. Gets stuffy in there sometimes. It does, yeah. <sighs> well, we should get back, though. So yeah, I figured we could spend a good chunk of the movie making fun of unnecessary sequels, you know? Just being very self-aware about the cash grabbiness of it all. Okay, but just to be sure so I can tell the shareholders, we're still gonna do that, right? We are, yeah, but by being self-aware about the cash grab, we make the cash grab clever. Oh, I love it. Take a big meta crap all over me. I can take it. Oh, meta craps are tight. All right. So anyway, Neo has no choice but to make this fourth Matrix game, but he also feels like he's losing his mind a little bit. Oh, he does? Yeah, he's not sure what's real or not, and his therapist is making him take these blue pills. Oh, that's part of the IP. It is, yeah. So we're gonna spend a bunch of the movie just pretty much remaking the first Matrix movie, but slightly different. What do you mean? Well, we're gonna kind of discover what the Matrix is. The audience already knows what the Matrix is. They do, yeah. So we're gonna show them again, and also just play a bunch of clips from the first movie. Sure, why not? We do own those. Oh, we're gonna have Morpheus in the movie, except it's not him, except it is, and he's played by a different actor. Oh, and what's he gonna do? He's gonna be in the movie. Amazing. Oh, and we're gonna have Agent Smith in the movie, except it's not him, except it is, and it's played by a different actor. Oh, and what's he gonna do? Also in the movie, sir. I love it. And so eventually this team of real world characters are gonna discover Neo in the Matrix, so they arrange this big rescue operation to get him out of the Matrix. 
tricks. You know, again. Wow, so what do they need him for? You know, not much, really. Oh. Yeah, just kind of want to get him out of there. Dude's a legend. Kinda low stakes. Kinda, yeah. So then Neo wakes up in a gooey pod again, and he sees that Trinity is still in a pod right next to him. Now, she was an important character. She sure was, sir. And when Neo was still in the Matrix, he kept encountering Trinity, except her name was Tiffany, and she had, like, a whole family, which was super weird. Very weird. So then Neo's gonna talk to Niobe from the other sequels, except she's super old now. Oh, how come? Well, sir, turns out 60 years have passed, and there was a whole machine civil war, and some of the machines sided with humans. Wow, you know, that actually sounds like a really interesting movie. Right? Anyway, so back to this one. Sure. So Neo's gonna meet Sati, who was a little girl that he spoke to in the third movie. All right. And she explains that somehow he and Trinity were resurrected. So Neo's like, oh, I gotta go save Trinity. She's still in the Matrix. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because see, if he doesn't get her out of the Matrix, she might take her fake Matrix kids to soccer practice or something. Eh, that does sound awful. So Neo and that team of characters head back into the Matrix, and they encounter a bunch of exiled programs they have to fight. Oh boy, yeah, it's gonna be amazing. And obviously we'll get Keanu to do a bunch of incredible hand-to-hand -hand combat. Eh, something wrong. Well, you know, his schedule's kinda nuts these days. I don't know how much fight choreography we can really do with him. Oh! Oh, okay. Is that all right? Kind of a big part of the Matrix movies. Uh, right, so not a huge deal. Kind of a huge deal. Oh, you know what? Maybe he can move things with his mind. Kind of a force push situation. Uh... Okay, yeah, sure, so whenever Neo gets into some kind of conflict, he kind of just force pushes people away from him just over and over and over again. That'll be very fun to watch. It might be. You know, let's roll the dice. Yeah, roll them! So eventually Neo's gonna see his therapist, who it turns out is this program called The Analyst, who made this new Matrix. Okay. And he's gonna kind of trap him in time using the power that defined Neo against him. You know, bullet time. Wasn't bullet time the name of the filming technique to show Neo's abilities and not the ability itself? Itself. That's certainly possible. So this guy is gonna use bullet time. Oh, very cool. And he's gonna explain that keeping Neo and Trinity close together could power the Matrix, but if they got too close, they became too powerful. All right. And eventually they do get close, and now they need to escape the Matrix together. Oh boy, do they have agents after them? No, 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 agents aren't really a thing anymore. Now they use this thing called swarm mode. Swarm mode? Yeah, see, what they do is they take over a bunch of people and kind of turn them into zombies that just throw themselves at the good guys. So now the machines waste a bunch of batteries instead of just a few. That's their new strategy, yeah. So then Neo, I guess, uses his force push a whole bunch. Very exciting. And that's gonna lead to him and Trinity needing to jump off a building. Oh man, it's gonna be hard to get out of that situation. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yes, he turns out Trinity can fly. Oh, yeah, you know, used to be Neo, now it's Trinity, so that's how that, you know, that, that works out. Why? Because that works. And so, yeah, that's about it. What do you think? Well, you know, it's, uh... What's the story exactly? Uh, how can I explain the, um... Uh, have you ever had a dream where you, you did, you could, you want, you... You could, you had to, you would, you, you want, you, you had, you could, you want, you... You want them to do you so much you can do anything? Yes, of course. So pretty much that. Okay, got it. Well, I mean, sounds good. You know, it's a Matrix movie, so it's gonna kill at the box office. You know it. So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. And I think this would be the perfect vehicle for Keanu Reeves. Uh, well, actually, we make movies, not cars, but thanks so much for coming in. No, 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 it's like an expression, right? Like a, like a star vehicle? Oh, a star vehicle. Yeah. Like a spaceship. No. Oh, well, we don't make spaceships, but thanks so much for coming in. Okay, I have a movie that would be great for Keanu Reeves. Oh, well, you should have led with that. What's the movie? Okay, good. So it's called John Wick, right? And it follows this guy named John Wick. That explains the title, making a lot of sense so far. Yeah, and so at the beginning of the movie, his wife dies. Oh, what does she die of? She dies of being the wife of the main character in an action movie. Oh, yeah, that can be deadly. Yeah, so she arranges to have a puppy delivered to John so he can have something to love after she's gone. Very adorable. Yeah, and so he starts to take care of this dog, right? He feeds it cereal because he doesn't have dog food yet, and he takes it on a joyride around an airport and probably gives it some whiplash. What? But while he's out, he goes to the gas station, right? And this spoiled Russian gangster kid, Yosef, wants to buy his car from him, but he's like, no, 
not, it's not for sale. Okay. And in Russian, Yosef says everything has a price, and then John answers back in Russian, so Yosef is like, what? Oh, he's mad, he's upset. He's very mad. He's so mad that that night him and his buddies break into John's house. How did they find out where he lives? Unclear, and so they beat him up and they steal his car. Well, as long as the dog is okay. And they kill his dog. Okay, some people better die for that. Oh, don't you worry, they will. That's the whole plot of the movie. John Wick is gonna kill people for an hour and a half because his dog was murdered? That's right, sir. I'm absolutely okay with that, to be honest. You can't mess with dogs. No, sir, you can't. People like them much more than they like humans. They certainly do. So what happens next? Well, Yosef tries to get some new plates for John's car from this guy, Aurelio, and Aurelio slaps him in the face. Oh, he does? Yeah, and so Aurelio gets a call from Yosef's father, Vigo, who's like the head of a criminal enterprise, and he's like, hey, I heard you hit my son. What's up with that? And what does Aurelio say? Well, he's like, yeah, I did, sir, because your son stole John Wick's car and killed his dog. And so Vigo's like, oh. Oh, why is this guy so scared of John? Well, it turns out that John is like this amazing retired assassin, right? The Russians call him Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga? What does that mean? It means the boogeyman, sir. You don't have to look it up. It means the boogeyman. Okay, it says here in Slavic folklore, Baba Yaga is a supernatural being who appears as a deformed old woman with drooping breasts. What? So how droopy are John's breasts exactly? Just say when so I know. Oh, I was so sure it was Boogeyman. Okay, yeah, I think that's Babeka. Oh, dang it. Well, I already wrote Baba Yaga. Well, it's probably fine. Okay, good. I'd have to, like, reprint this and everything. Yeah, no, don't even worry about it. So what does the droopy-breasted witch do next? Well, so Vigo sends a bunch of guys to his house to kill him, right? Okay. And so John has to kill them all using gun fu. Uh, I think that's pronounced kung fu. No, it's not kung fu. It's a mix of jujitsu and judo and, uh, you know, shooting people in the face. Oh, it is. Yeah, so he's gonna shoot a bunch of these assassins point-blank in the face and also stab some of them, but mostly shoot them point-blank in the face. Uh, that sounds intense. Tense. Oh, it will be, sir, and we're gonna keep that going throughout the movie all the way up until, I'd say, the high 70s. What, Fahrenheit? No, corpses. Oh, my God. Yeah, we're also gonna get glimpses of this, like, assassin underworld that John was a part of. Like, they have a whole system in place. Oh, they do? Yeah, like, the cops don't mess with them. They have these little gold coins they use as currency. They even have their own hotel. Oh, please explain this all to me in excruciating detail. Actually, I feel like it might be kind of nice to just hint at the mythology rather than shoving it down people's throats. Can we at least throw a love interest in there for him? No. Oh, goodness, no. Hey, you're making it really tough for me to ruin this thing. Okay, what happens next? Well, John checks in at this assassin hotel, and there's like a code of honor there. You can't kill anyone while you're in the hotel. Wow, so people must get shot all the time walking out the front door. Probably. So he checks in at this hotel, and then he finds out that Yosef is at a nightclub, so he heads over there. Oh, and what happens there? Oh, uh, pow, 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 pow. Were those heads being shot? Those were heads being shot. Yeah, that's right. Pow, 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 pow. Yeah, so he shoots a guy in the head. He shoots another guy in the head. He also shoots a guy in the head, drowns a guy, and snaps his neck, actually. Oh, mixing things up is tight. Yeah, and so anyway, Yosef manages to get away, so John goes back to the hotel, but an assassin lady tries to kill him. I thought you weren't allowed to do that at the hotel. You're not? No, but somebody offered her a lot of money to break the rules. Oh, people can be bribed into breaking the rules. That doesn't seem like a safe place to stay at all. Well, anyway, he survives, so it all works out. Well, okay then. And then he finds out that Vigo runs a church as a front for some illegal stuff, so he blows all that stuff up. Oh, why does he do that? Well, that lures Vigo and his men out, so John gets a couple more headshots, but then he gets hit by a car. Oh no. Yeah, not good, no. So then Vigo has some of his guys suffocate him with a plastic bag. Well, it's gonna be tough for him to get out of that situation. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, John's friend Marcus snipes one of the guys through a window, and then John manages to kill the other one. But isn't Vigo standing right there? Oh, no, he left. He left? Yeah, no, he figured his men can handle it, so, you know, he took off. He's been trying to kill John this whole movie. He doesn't stick around for a minute to see if the job gets done. That's what we're going with, because the movie's not done yet. Well, okay. Okay, then. So then John catches up with Vigo, and Vigo's like, okay, okay, I'll tell you where my son is, just don't kill me. And John agrees to that? That's what we're going with, because the movie's not done yet. Well, okay then. So then John kills Yosef in like two seconds. Oh, well, straight to the point. Yeah, so that's all done, but then Vigo kills Marcus, so John needs to get some more revenge. Oh, he does? Yeah, so he tracks down Vigo and kills his men, and that's when we have the movie's big showdown. So what's the big showdown? A fist fight with a 60-year-old. Oh, okay, is this guy ripped or something? Not particularly, no. Is he like a, like a great martial artist? Yeah. Oh, okay. So then John manages to kill this guy, and then he finds a dog, and that's it. We're done. Doggy. So what do you think? Well, I think it sounds like a lot of fun. Thanks. I just feel like there's probably a big audience of Matrix fans out there that would love to see Keanu do some more action stuff, you know? That's a good idea, and if it works, we could kick things up a notch in the sequel. How would we do that? I don't know. We'll figure something out. 
So, you have a John Wick sequel for me? Yes, sir, I do. So this one's gonna be called John Wick Chapter 2. Oh, it was a book this whole time. No, it wasn't. So at the beginning of this movie, John Wick's killing a bunch of people trying to get his Mustang back, right? Oh, boy. Yeah, it's gonna be nuts. It's gonna be like bumper cars, but with murder. <laughs> Is there any other kind? Yes. Okay, well, that explains the Six Flags ban, doesn't it? Oh, you might be going to jail. So John goes to see the brother of the bad guy from the first movie, and he's like, I want peace, actually. Oh, he doesn't kill him? He doesn't. So then he goes home, because he wants to be retired again and hang out with his new dog. Understandable. But then this guy Santino shows up. And what's his deal? Well, it turns out back in the day, he helped John retire in exchange for a marker. Like one of those scented ones? No, this is like an IOU thing. He can use it at any time to make John assassinate someone. So John got out of the assassin game in exchange for a thing that would immediately bring him back into the assassin game. That's right. Oh, very bad planning. So Santino wants John Wick to kill someone for him, but John is like, nah. Oh. Okay, well, I guess we don't need any action in the sequel. Oh no, sir, there's gonna be action. They're gonna piss John Wick off, and he's gonna have no choice but to get involved. Okay. You see, in the first movie, they killed his dog, and in this one, they blow up his house. Why would they blow up the dog's house? They blow up John Wick's house. That makes more sense. So then John goes to see that Winston guy at the Continental Assassin Hotel, and Winston's like, yeah, that's a marker. You gotta do whatever this guy says. Bummer. So what is this job? Well, he wants John to kill his sister Gianna, because she's about to be put on the high high table of assassins in Rome. Okay. So John is like, that's an impossible job. That can't be done. And so Santino's like, yeah, that's why I want you. Oh, so it's gonna be tough to get to her. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? It turns out he gets a map that leads directly to her dressing room where she's totally unguarded. So then why did Santino specifically need John Wick? Unclear. So then John tries to just walk out through her big coronation party instead of through the secret tunnels he came in by. Interesting strategy. How does that work out for him? Oh, not well, sir. He's spotted by Gianna's personal bodyguard, Cassian, pretty much right away. Oh, that didn't work out at all. Not really, no. But now we get this awesome action scene where John Wick murders a bunch of people at a party. That does sound like a cool setting for the murders. It is. The lighting is crazy. There's a bunch of people. There's Tilda Swinton on the turntables. What? And so John shoots a bunch of people in the head and escapes. Amazing. This guy's great for the funeral industry. I guess he is. So now Santino wants John Wick dead to kind of tie up loose ends, you know? But John Wick, he's very hard to kill. Yeah, he really should have thought about having someone else walk through that empty tunnel to kill his sister if he planned on double-crossing him. Probably. So John goes back to New York, and he finds out that Santino put a $7 million bounty on his head. Okay. And that's how we're gonna find out just how intense this underground assassin society really is. What do you mean? Well, let's just say they could swing an election if they wanted to. But with, like, a strategic political assassination? No, just sheer numbers. Oh, my God. Yeah, it turns out they're there's an insane number of assassins out there, and they all get notified about this bounty. Oh, secret organizations that are actually mainstream are tight. So now John's got to fight all these assassins that are popping out of nowhere, like one of them's a musician in the subway. Does she just stand around playing music all day till she gets a murder notification on her phone? It would seem so, sir. Huh. And also, John's gonna have to go up against that Cassian guy again. Oh, he is? You see, they're both at this fountain surrounded by a bunch of people, so as soon as the water turns on, they shoot at each other. Isn't that kind of reckless of John with all the innocent bystanders? Well, he's very good at hitting his target, so he knows what he's doing. Oh, so he hits Cassian? Oh, no, he misses. Oh, okay. So then we're gonna have this funny scene where they're shooting at each other with silencers, and everybody around them's completely oblivious. I mean, guns with silencers still make a decent amount of noise. No, they don't. People don't hear the bullet impacts and the concrete flying and whatnot? No, they don't. Well, okay, then. So John finally stabs Cassian and then manages to escape some other assassins with the help of a homeless guy. Oh, that's nice of the homeless guy. What inspired him to help? Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing about this guy is that he's an assassin, too. Right, I should have guessed that. And he's part of a massive network of other homeless people assassins. Is anyone not an assassin? Uh... Uh, John Wick's dog, he's not an assassin. Oh, uh, what a good boy. For now. Okay. So then John goes to see the leader of the Homeless People Assassin Network, and I was thinking we could get Lawrence Fishburne to play him. They're both in another movie together. They sure are, sir. Amazing. So John has to make a deal with this guy, because he desperately needs a gun. He can't fight with his hands and then steal someone's gun? Irrelevant. Kind of relevant. Irrelevant. So this guy's like, all right, the bounty's $7 million. I'm going to give you a gun with seven bullets. Oh, I bet that's going to 
going to come into play later. You'd think so, but no, no, not really. Oh, okay. So then John goes to this museum where Santino is, and he immediately starts killing people and taking their guns. Right, because, yeah. And eventually he gets to this hall of mirrors, which, as you know, means it's impossible for him to hear where the bad guy's yelling from. Of course, I've seen movies. Me too. So then John takes out a bunch of guys that are bigger than him, which leads us to the climax of the fight. Oh, which is? A battle of strength between him and someone 95 pounds lighter than him. That's, I feel like there's no contest there. Yeah, and so then he wins because of, you know, the weight difference. How would she have? There was no way. So then what happens? Well, then John shoots Santino in the head at the Continental Hotel, which is not allowed in the world of assassins. Oh, yeah, why'd he do that? To set up the next movie. Oh, that's thoughtful of him. So then Winston tells him that the bounty on his head has now doubled and been expanded globally. Uh-oh. And because he likes him, he's giving him an hour head start before he sends the message out. Wow, well, sounds pretty serious. It is. And then Winston shows off a little flash mob thing he organized. Everybody around them just stops. What? A little flash mob. Why would he... Why would he organize that? Oh, well, you know, to, like, to show John how powerful the organization is. I mean... John knows that, doesn't he? He's part of the organization. Yeah, well, still pretty cool. Why would that must have taken so much planning? A little, yeah, yeah, probably. He had to gather them all there, brief them on when to surprise John, have people block off access to normal civilians walking by. Uh huh. Yeah. Well. He really wanted to send this message to John, though. You know that he already knew. That he already knew. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I mean, all right. So then John and his dog have to run away. Well, the dog probably thinks they're just going for a fun little run. Well, the dog's probably having a pretty good time. And so then that's it. What do you think? Well, it sounds like a lot of fun, you know? Thank you. I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of the simple grittiness of the first movie, you know? Let's not go too over the top with things, especially in the third one. Oh, yeah, of course not. So, you have a third John Wick movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. So as you know, at the end of the last movie, John Wick had one hour before a $14 million bounty on his head started. I did know that. He's got to get to safety fast. He had a bunch of people around him, any of which could have been killers. Exactly. So he heads right to Times Square, right? Oh, okay. Seems like one of the worst possible places to go in a world full of assassins. Well, that may be true, but it's going to look cool visually. Oh, okay. Well, then great. So John sends his dog off to safety safety at the Continental with this cab driver. The cab driver accepts to drive a dog, no questions asked. Yeah, we'll see the thing about this cab driver. Oh, he's part of the underground assassin world too, isn't he? He's part of the underground assassin world. Right, okay. Cab drivers, homeless people, street musicians, all part of the secret world. He's kind of getting out of hand. A little bit. So then John goes to this library because he hid some emergency stuff inside this book. Oh man, time must be running out until he's excommunicado. Oh yeah, so then the seven foot three guy pops out and he's like, hey, Hey, John, you know, if I kill you a couple minutes before the timer's up, who's really gonna know? If that's his attitude, why didn't he just walk up and shoot John instead of talking to him first? Oh, unclear. So then they have this big fight and John kills the guy with a frickin' book. Oh, uh, this guy's using all kinds of school supplies as murder weapons. He sure is, sir. But turns out this tall guy nicked an artery in John's neck, so he needs to get some medical assistance before the timer's up. God, how long is this 60-minute timer? Uh, good question, sir. This particular 60-minute timer's five Five hours long. Oh, okay. So then because of the rules, the doctor has to stop right when the timer's up and John has to finish stitching himself up himself. Geez, so now the assassins can come get him? They sure can, sir. So John immediately gets hit by two cars. Oh, yikes. I mean, there's no way that freshly stitched artery doesn't pop open, right? But, uh, the stitches are fine. We've established that car accidents just kind of tickle John Wick. Right, so is he, like, invincible or? Oh, no, no, no. He can get hurt. He can? Yeah, of course, but just not in any way that'll slow the movie down or prevent him from killing anyone in any way. Oh, well, fantastic. So then John's gonna kill a bunch more people in very cool ways. What kind of ways are we talking? Oh, well, like at a certain point, he slaps a horse so that it kicks a guy in the face. Oh, strategic horse slapping is tight. It sure is, sir. And then he's gonna ride a horse while assassins chase him on motorcycles. Can't those guys just shoot the horse? Well, yeah, of course, but they're not gonna. Why not? Because that works. So now John's gotta get out of New York, so he goes to see this lady. What for? Well, sir, turns out there's another symbol doodad in this universe besides markers and coins. Oh, yeah, so he exchanges this doodad for a favor. That's kind of a lot of randomly valuable doodads, isn't it? Getting kind of repetitive in this lore. Oh, did I say doodad? I meant doohickey. Oh, a doohickey! Okay, that changes things up. Okay, great. So thanks to the doohickey, he gets safe passage to Morocco, because he's got to go see this other lady and give her a doodad in exchange for a favor. But that, okay. And he needs this lady to bring him to a man, because he needs to ask that man where to find another man, because he needs 
needs to ask that man a favor. So, like, what's the story of this movie? Oh, sir, I just told you, John's got to talk to some people and call in some favors to talk to other people and call in favors to talk to other people and call in favors. It's a little boring, isn't it? Just meetings with various people? Well, I mean, yeah, but you're forgetting the super well choreographed murder sprees in between the meetings. Oh, okay, that's right. I do like watching the killings. So eventually this guy tells John how to go meet this guy called the Elder who can help him stop being excommunicado. And how's he supposed to get to the Elder? He needs to go to the edge of the desert and then walk towards the brightest star until he passes out. Oh, that's just so extremely vague. And eventually this lady, Sophia, who's been helping John out because of a marker, she drops him off at the edge of the desert. How are they supposed to know that's the right spot? Unclear, but it totally is. So then John walks until he passes out and wakes up with the Elder. Oh, the incredibly vague directions worked. They did. So this guy makes John cut off his own finger and give him his ring and agree to go kill Winston. Why does he want Winston dead? Well, see, since Winston had helped John, the high table sent this adjudicator person to tell him he's getting removed as head of the Continental. Oh, very serious. Yeah. So then John goes back to New York and there's this guy Zero after him. So they both do some magic at each other in public and it's very fun. Nice little break for some magic. Sure. And John makes it back to the Continental just barely in time before Zero kills him. So he's safe there? Well, yeah, because of that rule where business can't be conducted on hotel grounds. But he's excommunicado, so he's not allowed on hotel grounds. Well, now he is, because he agreed to kill Winston, which is what he's here to do. Winston's on the hotel grounds, though. Yeah. So John Wick's not allowed to kill him. No. Okay. So anyway, John goes to see Winston, and after a brief conversation, he's like, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna kill you. Why not? Changed his mind. Oh, okay, so the whole middle section of the movie and the finger cutting was kind of pointless. No, it wasn't. Filled up a whole bunch of runtime and split up the killing scenes quite nicely. That's a good point. So then the adjudicator arrives, but since Winston refuses to abdicate and John refuses to kill him, they deconsecrate the Continental. What does that mean? Oh, well, now they could send a bunch of high table assassins to kill John and Winston. Oh boy. And at a certain point, John is killing a guy underwater, and when he pops out of the water, there's a guy waiting there to kill him. Oh no, it's gonna be hard to get out of that situation. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see that Zero guy who's a big fan of John Wick kills this guy because he's like, no, I'm the one who's gonna kill John Wick. Wow, well, thank God this guy has a weird obsession with John Wick. Yeah, it worked out great. So then it's time for the big final showdown in a house of mirrors. Oh, that was the location of the final showdown in the last movie. Oh, yeah, dang it, you're right. Okay, so it takes place in a house of glass panels that reflect stuff. That works. So John is gonna fight some assassins, but they respect him so much they don't kill him when they have the chance on several occasions. Oh, wait, he's just defeating people with respect now? Yeah, this guy's unkillable. He's so freaking good. Well, yeah, if people don't kill him when they have the opportunity to do so. Still counts, and so then he kills that Zero guy. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Wow. So the adjudicator comes back and they're like, wow, Winston, this was all just a big show of strength, wasn't it? I'm impressed. Wait, what? But then they're like, but what are we gonna do about John Wick? But what are they talking about? John Wick was the show of strength. Yeah, for sure, but Winston says New York City was the show of strength. I guess that makes sense. Maybe. So then Winston shoots John a bunch of times and he falls off a building. Oh my god. Yeah, it's brutal. Shot multiple times, falls from super high up. Wow, okay, so John Wick dies. Well, that was the only way this trilogy was gonna end if you think about it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, he's still alive, isn't he? You know it, sir. This guy's never gonna die. Oh. None of this will ever die. Oh, man, that's great news. We're gonna keep going with this franchise forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. It's about bank robbing surfers. Yep, 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 yep. I'm buying that. Let's do this. Oh. I mean, do you want to hear the story, or...? I guess so, but that's, you know, I'm already in. Well, great, okay, so we're gonna meet this guy named Johnny Utah, right? Okay, and what's his real name? Johnny Utah. I mean... I don't believe you. Well, that is what we're going with. And so this guy's a new FBI agent in Los Angeles, and he meets his new partner, Papas. Right. And he's gonna learn about these bank robbers called the ex-presidents. And these guys are super precise. They're in and they're out in 90 seconds. They only steal from the cash drawers. Oh, very smart. And Papas has this theory that these guys are surfers, and Johnny's like, well, I can infiltrate the surf world. This guy had a theory that they were in the surfer community and never looked into the surfer community. No, he needed Johnny Utah to think of that part, so they're gonna send and him undercover. Wow, 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 wow. And let me tell you, Johnny's the perfect person to be an undercover agent in the field, because he's 
you know, a famous person with a bad knee. Wait, what? Yeah, he's a highly recognizable football star with mobility issues. Wait, this doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah, no, that doesn't make sense at all. Oh, uh, whoops. Whoopsie. Anyway, so Johnny gets himself a surfboard and he starts surfing. So wait, there are like thousands of surfers in Los Angeles and a bunch of beaches. It's going to be hard for him to infiltrate the exact group he's looking for. Actually, it's going to be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, literally the first person he encounters turns out to be the ex-girlfriend of the lead bank robber. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, that is convenient. Incredibly so. I mean, what are the odds of that, right? You tell me. No. Okay. Yeah, so he meets this girl, Tyler, and she yells at him for being an irresponsible surfer, and he's like, oh, I am into this girl. Yeah, he's attracted to her. He is, yeah. So he watches her change through some binoculars. Oh, what? No, that's incredibly creepy. Actually, no, it's not creepy because he's the main character and also good looking. Oh, okay, okay. So then he uses his position in the FBI to look up her personal information. Very romantic now that I know that he's He's good looking. It is, yeah. And he finds out that her parents are dead, so he's like, oh, perfect. What? Well, he's like looking for a conversation starter, right? Because this girl is his main lead. And does he know that she has the connection he needs for his case? Not at all. He just saw an attractive girl on the beach, and he's pursuing that in the hopes that it's going to pay off, which of course it will. Well, great. So he goes to see her at the diner where she works, and he's like, man, now that my parents are dead, I'm free to do whatever I want and stop living for them. Yeah, I feel like that's not the right approach to bond with someone who has dead parents. Well, somehow it works immediately and she agrees to teach him how to surf. Oh, well, fantastic. And what undercover name does he give himself? Oh, no, he just uses his real name, Johnny Utah, because, again, he's famous. Right. So then Johnny is going to meet Tyler's ex, this guy named Bodie, and, of course, the surfers all recognize Johnny because he's a famous football star. Yeah, I feel like this isn't a safe way to be undercover. Yeah, don't worry about it. And so then Johnny becomes a part of the crew immediately. Well, great. And then one day Johnny's going to get attacked by these super violent surfer guys. I mean, these guys are just insane. Oh, no, crazy people. And so Johnny's gonna be like, oh, maybe these are the sophisticated bank robbers. That doesn't, that doesn't seem to add up. Yeah, but he looks them up in the FBI system and turns out they do have criminal records. Right, okay, but that still doesn't mean they're the sophisticated bank robbers. So anyway, they go raid these guys' house. Okay. And so Papas goes to the front door and he does this whole bit about how he has a lost dog and stuff. Well, why would he do that? Why don't they just raid the house with the element of surprise? I don't know, but because he does that, the bad guys have time to grab guns and the whole thing turns into an absolute bloodbath. You know, I'm starting to think these guys are not very good FBI agents. Oh, also turns out one of the guys in that crew was an undercover DEA agent. Really? Yeah, and he's like, these guys weren't even around for some of the ex-president's bank robberies. What are you guys doing here? And none of that showed up on the FBI file for these guys? I guess they didn't notice that part. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, yeah, these guys are very bad at their jobs. Well, you say that now, but Johnny is eventually gonna realize that the people he's hanging out with are bank robbers. Oh, well, good, you know, that's great. Yeah, so he goes on a stakeout on their next bank robbery, but then he misses it because he was ordering meatball subs and Papas was reading a newspaper in the car. Oh my god. Anyway, then when they realize the bank is being robbed, Johnny starts chasing them. Is he like covering his face or something? No, he's not covering his face at all. He's just fully sprinting at the people with whom he's been undercover for weeks. Okay. So he ends up going on this massive foot chase with Bodie. They're gonna go through a neighborhood where nobody locks their doors for some reason. Bodie's gonna throw a dog at Johnny. Oh, throwing dogs at people is tight. And eventually Johnny's gonna hurt his bad knee and not be able to run anymore. Oh no. Yeah, so he takes out his gun and fires a bunch of shots into the sky while screaming. Well, that's a terrible strategy. There's no way those bullets are gonna hit their target. Oh no, this is like a frustration thing because he can't bring himself to shoot his new friend. Oh, okay, gotcha. So anyway, then Johnny heads to see Tyler, who's pretty much his girlfriend now. His cover's blown and he immediately goes to the woman with a direct connection to the criminals? He does, yeah. Well, okay then. And she ends up finding out that he's an FBI agent because he left his badge lying around. Oh, he's just so very bad at being an FBI agent. He's not great at it, no. So then Bodie and the gang show up and they're like, hey Johnny, let's go skydiving. Okay, but they definitely know he's an FBI agent though, right? They do, yeah. They have a whole conversation about it. And he must know that his cover's blown because he ran at them with an exposed face for an extended period of time. He must know, yeah. So what... What is this? Well, they're gonna go skydiving. It's gonna be a fun skydiving scene. They enjoy skydiving. Do they plan on killing him midair or something? No, it's just they have a fun skydiving scene. They all land safely. Okay, but like why though? Well, see, the thing is later on in the movie, Johnny's gonna have to jump out of a plane, so we have to establish that he's done that before. Maybe just throw in a line of dialogue at some point. Right, right, right. Well, instead of that, we're gonna have this random skydiving scene, so I'm gonna need you to get all the way off my back about it. Oh, let me get off of that bad boy. So then Bodie's 
going to be like, oh, by the way, I had Tyler kidnapped and I'm going to have her killed if you don't help us rob a bank. He's still going to rob a bank even though the FBI knows who he is? That's right. Well, okay then. But then Bodhi strays from the plan and goes to the vault and everything goes wrong and crew members die and a cop gets killed. Why would he change his classic 90 second plan that ensures they never get caught? Well, because the movie's almost done. We got to raise the stakes a little. That's fair. And then later Pappas is going to get killed and Johnny's going to get on another plane with Bodhi. Oh boy. And Bodhi jumps out of the plane and Johnny's going to have to follow him without a parachute. This isn't his first time jumping out of a plane. I learned that earlier. Correct. This is his second time, so he's an expert now. He maneuvers and catches up to Bodhi and grabs on. Wow, 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 wow. So he ends up landing with him and getting reunited with Tyler, and she is so happy to see him. Wasn't she mad at him because of the FBI thing? Yeah, but now that his shenanigans got her kidnapped and almost killed, she's all over that. Oh, well, great. And then we're going to jump to months later in Australia, and Johnny tracks down Bodhi. How did he know he was going to be there? Because Bodhi kept talking about this 50-year storm happening that he absolutely had to surf. Oh, smart. He did his job well this time. So then Johnny's gonna be like, you know, I've been tracking you for months and I finally caught up with you. Why would he waste the FBI's money doing that if he knew this guy was gonna be here on that day? I don't know, but then Johnny goes to arrest Bodhi and Bodhi's like, hey man, just let me surf this wave, okay? Just let me die on this wave. And Johnny's like, okay. Oh. Yeah, he really wanted to die on this wave and so Johnny lets him do that and then tosses his badge and he quits being an FBI agent. No sequels or franchising or anything like that? Well, I don't really know if you can make a franchise out of an FBI agent in Los Angeles infiltrating an adrenaline-based group of criminals and also falling in love with a waitress with a direct personal connection to said gang. Hi, Ryan here. Thanks for watching that pitch meeting. Hope you liked it. Don't know why I said that all on the same note. If you did like the video, please share and like. That helps out a lot. And let me know in the comment section what movies you want to see pitches for. As always, check back soon for a new one. See you guys on the next video. Bye-bye.